Welcome to Prescription for Justice. Today's topic, teaching social justice. Democracy requires an informed and involved citizenry. An informed populace is achievable through quality public education, available to all and free of corporate influence, along with an independent press staffed by curious and courageous reporters. An involved populace requires economic security, the recognition of life's fleeting nature, and the value of nature and community and the time and willingness to become involved in the political process. Brazilian educator Paulo Freire is best known for his influential work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, in which he describes an educational method involving not only reading the word, but also reading the world. This leads to the development of critical consciousness, which allows learners to question the nature of their historical and social situation with the goal of creating a more democratic society. Freire wrote, education either functions as an instrument which is used to facilitate integration of the younger generation into the logic of the present system and bring about conformity, or it becomes the practice of freedom, the means by which men and women deal critically and creatively with reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. In the first episode of this program, available on our YouTube channel and through the Public Health and Social Justice website, we discuss the education system in the United States, making comparisons to other countries and offering suggestions for improvement. In this episode, we focus specifically on teaching social justice. Social injustices abound in the United States, exemplified by the status of women, who are still paid 70 cents on the dollar for the same work done by men, a number unchanged since the 1960s, by inequality between the races and access to quality education, housing, and economic opportunities, by the unfair treatment of minorities by the criminal justice system, by the lack of health insurance that contributes to 28,000 deaths per year, and by ongoing war, militarism, and environmental degradation that imperil the survival of our species. Today, 16% of adults have not completed high school, 30% have no schooling beyond high school, 27% have attended but not completed college, and only 28% are college graduates. Rates vary dramatically across racial and ethnic groups. High levels of de facto school segregation by race and socioeconomic status persist, manifested by gross discrepancies in per pupil spending and teacher salaries, as well as decaying infrastructure. One-third of America's 80,000 schools need extensive repair or replacement. One-third or more have mold, dust, or other indoor air quality problems. 25% of Americans are functionally illiterate. 30% of U.S. teens are unable to locate the Pacific Ocean on a map. Almost 70% cannot find the United Kingdom. One in four Americans don't realize that the Earth revolves around the sun. One in three do not believe in evolution, and meanwhile believe that humans and dinosaurs coexisted. And only a small majority now believe in global warming. Meanwhile, 54% believe places can be haunted, 25% believe in UFOs, 24% believe in reincarnation, and 24% also believe in astrology. Through greenwash, advertising and front groups, corporations, often with scientific sounding names like the American Council on Science and Health, the National Wilderness Institute, and the Foundation for Clean Air Progress, promulgate misinformation designed to increase profits and decrease regulation. Many corporations provide, free of charge, curricula to cash-strap schools, presenting students with a false or at least very skewed understanding of important scientific concepts. Such curricula include Exxon's Energy Cube, which includes statements like, gasoline is simply solar power hidden in decayed matter, and offshore drilling creates reefs for fish, or international paper syllabus, which states, Clear cutting promotes growth of trees that require full sunlight and allows efficient site preparation for the next crop. All true, albeit misleading statements. The U.S. spends $290 billion per year on advertising. 10% of a two-year-old's nouns are brand names. The average American can recognize over a thousand corporate logos, but fewer than 10 native plants and animals. The average American child, age 8 to 18, spends eight hours per day using an electronic device and or watching TV. The average American adult spends 93% of life indoors, and U.S. children spend less time outside than the average prisoner. There are 40% fewer journalists than just a decade ago. Reporters are now outnumbered by public relations flats. 
for all our rhetoric about children being our future. We pay teachers relatively little. While military budgets are astronomical, many teachers pay out of pocket for school supplies for their students. The fact that the top 25 U.S. hedge fund managers take home more income than all kindergarten teachers combined speaks volumes about our national priorities. And yet, for every $1 spent on early childhood education, up to $17 are saved from increased school achievement, improved health, reduced crime, and reduced reliance on public assistance. Greater educational attainment leads to better employment opportunities and higher income, which are linked with better health. Income increases 11% for every year of education, and college graduates live five years longer than high school dropouts. According to a peer-reviewed analysis, eliminating educational inequities in the U.S. would have saved eight times as many lives as all medical advances did between 1996 and 2002. From 1984 to 2009, college tuition costs rose 440% and they continue to rise. Student debt has skyrocketed to $1.3 trillion compared with just $2 billion a decade ago. Aggregate student loan debt exceeds all Americans' credit card debt. At the university level, most full-time faculty have been replaced by contingent or adjunct faculty who now constitute 75% of college teachers. Their average salaries are about $25,000, and most positions lack benefits, job security, and opportunities for significant career advancement. Many adjuncts shuttle between institutions. Some sleep in their cars. Meanwhile, the number of administrators has skyrocketed. Most are paid quite generously. Fortunately, while teacher unions are under attack, many are fighting back, seeking higher salaries and better health care coverage through strikes. On a positive note, many very talented individuals continue to become teachers, driven by a passion for sharing knowledge and, equally important, for learning with and from their students. Many are hamstrung by rigid curricula with minimal time to engage students as they explore their own interests, by uninspired textbooks, and by administrative pressures to teach to the test at the expense of, ex at the expense of encouraging free, exploratory thinking. My guest is Hyung Nam, a South Korean immigrant and community activist who studied political philosophy, worked with at-risk youth in both residential and school settings, then became a social studies teacher. He has been teaching for Portland Public Schools since 2000, participated in social justice teacher groups, and served on the editorial board of Rethinking Schools and the steering committee for the Northwest Teaching for Social Justice Conference. Hyung, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Tell me, what function does education have in our society and, and what function should it have? Well, you know, I think that's a contested thing. Um, and, you know, obviously we need the younger generation to get some kind of education. And depending on one's point of view and the kind of um, world society that one wants to create, um, there are some forces and people trying to create um, an education for basically um, reproducing a, an unfair and unequal and undemocratic society. Mm -hmm. um, to give you a good quote of that, um, Woodrow Wilson, when he was president at Princeton University, said this. He said, we want one class of persons to have a liberal education. And we want another class of persons, a very much larger class of necessity in every society to forego the privileges of a liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific difficult manual tasks. So I think we have to look at, you know, not just education, but the kind of society that we had because under slavery, they denied education to enslaved people. In fact, if it was um, illegal to learn to read, to teach um, enslaved people to read, and then under even um, industrial capitalism, the goal, as I just read the quote from w Wilson, was to basically prepare people to be low-paid um, manual laborers. And was, was Wilson being facetious, or, or was oh he no, being that was that was just um, telling it as it is. Let's create a, a colony of worker bees, essentially. Yeah, with a queen and a, and really that was you know. Um, Public education, just like democracy, was not something that the founders of this country thought um, central to this country. They did not put it in the Constitution. They left it up to states. And um, states decided you know, both not to make 
voting accessible to the entire populace. And same thing with education, but once there was a need for preparing people to work in industrial factory jobs, people realized that there was a certain need for at least some level of education, basic literacy, but especially more things that we would say are not so academic, um, things like respecting and following authority, following orders, um, following schedules and bells and things like that. So those kinds of things needed to, people needed to be socialized and taught those kind of skills, mm -hmm. which are really in some, many ways antithetical to, um, a, you know, the kind of education that we need for a democratic society. But really, you know, I would say the same thing. Um, you know, it's great what you said in the beginning about the struggle for social justice, um, that we need good education for democracy. But I think that's the whole problem, is that democracy is always a struggle and has never been a given. And, you know, for most of this country's history, we did not have a democracy and we've been people have been struggling for democracy for a long time and we've made some many important gains with democracy and with education but there it's a long struggle there's much more to struggle for absolutely what have been some of the major changes in say the last 20 years in education policy yeah you know it's been interesting that um, I did not think about education policy so much when I first got into teaching um, I just thought that what was important was engaging students and thinking about um, teaching students to understand society and to become agents in transforming society to become more democratic. But what I realized was that um, education, what they call education reform, has been really been kind of hijacked by corp corporate interests. And um, it's been it's really forced me to um, address it because it's gotten in the way of um, teaching the way that I, I want to teach and what inspired me to teach. So one thing is increased standardization, mm -hmm. increased testing, and really using both of those to attack teachers and um, to especially attack teachers' unions. And I think this is, it really, um, has a political function, and we can see that this has happened. It you know overlaps with the whole shift with um, neoliberalism in the United States, where education has been used as the scapegoat for the economic crises that we face. Mm -hmm. So we've seen the shift from the federal government being responsible for maintaining full employment and creating jobs and job opportunities to focusing on job training. Mm -hmm. And um, you know now we're seeing things like um, work requirements for entitlements and things like that being floated around. Um, but there's really been this um, attempt to blame education and teachers and teachers' unions for the economic problems that Americans are facing mm -hmm. so that politicians don't have to take the responsibility for managing our political economy and they could blame it on students and test scores and teachers. And um, it's been really a political tool in that way that have served multiple functions, including um, creating new markets and opportunities for corporations with um, privatizing, um, not only through things like charter schools or vouchers, but also partial privatization within public schools, outsourcing things, um, relying more on um, you know, corporate technology, um, you name it. So, mm -hmm. um, it, it is interesting when we talk about teachers being blamed. Uh, if you're, you're hamstringing teachers, um, you're not paying them adequately, you're setting up rigid requirements for what they're to teach, um, it takes away the whole function of education, which really should be a back and forth process of learning. Um, and uh, rather than teaching to uh, a set standard allowing students to explore their interests. I think that's what makes for the development of creativity. Yeah. That's what makes for innovation. Uh, the other n irony I see in what you mentioned is if we are going to just say, okay, we're a capitalist society, as, as, uh, as many in business will argue, CEOs make the amount of money that they deserve, uh, what does it say about teachers when the salaries are not 
much more competitive and much higher. Yeah, exactly. And you know, it's kind of ironic because um, there are a lot of there are some parents that will send their kids to private schools, mm -hmm. and actually in private schools, I actually was one of them. Um, I was a scholarship kid actually to a you know a prep school in Los Angeles where families now I think pay it's a day school they pay over forty thousand dollars in tuition a year for each of their kids. Um, and, you know, yeah. I've heard prices like that for preschools in Manhattan where oh, they yeah. actually have entrance exams and entrance interviews. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got a pretty smart almost five-year-old, but uh, <laughs> first of all, I would never put her in that sort of situation. That's not the kind of people I want her to be around, but it's l reached a level of ridiculousness. Absolutely. Yeah, what, what, what I was going to say is that at a school like that, um, the teachers in general get paid less than they do at public schools mm. and often the teachers are less prepared usually the teachers do not have a graduate degree in education um, many of my teachers at that at my former um, high school at, at my high school were basically people who were you know maybe in graduate school they were considering mm. um, they might have been in the middle of getting a graduate degree um, in whatever field maybe PhD or mm. whatever and, but some just, you know, were kind of stuck in between or they never went through. They kind of dropped right. out of the program and it was something to, you know, something they could do. And, you know, there are great people dedicated, of course. And, um, of course, we all learn so much on the job. But in many ways, they were less prepared and actually paid less and, actu and of course, had less rights um, as non-unionized teachers in a private school. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting that parents think that somehow they're getting more in a private school. Um, in many ways, as far as the qualification of the teachers go, goes, they get less. But what they get is more attention for their students, mm -hmm. smaller class sizes, mm -hmm. and, and so on. And that's key. Uh, I, I am going to be sending my daughter to the public school system where we live. Uh, and I must say, if I lived in a worse neighborhood, I would strongly reconsider that because you're stuck with, well, do I want my child handicapped from the get-go um, or do I want her to have at least the amount of opportunities that I've had in life, which is really what any parent wants. Yeah. Um, the thing about where I live is it's a de facto private school because they have the school district foundation, mm -hmm. which collects millions of dollars that they then use to hire band teachers, create art programs, oh, yeah. electives like photography, hire the best chemistry and history teachers. Um, so, and this is something that goes on around the country. Mm -hmm. But I, I sympathize with the dilemma of parents trying to make that decision. Um, fortunately for someone like me as a physician, I have the luxury of having that choice even, yeah. whereas many do not have that choice. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think one thing to remember is that, you know, while this, there's this kind of general attack on public schools and teachers unions, um, the U.S. actually has, we don't have a problem with education, what we have is a problem with inequality. Mm -hmm. um, when we compare test scores of students, right, often, you know, we, we look at how our test scores, test scores don't compare to um, students in other countries, but actually if we um, disaggregate that data and look at the test scores of um, upper class students in public schools with unionized teachers in their exclusive neighborhoods where um, the median property value is you know three million dollars like the neighborhood that my brother sends their um, my nephew and niece to public schools um, you know they have great results because a school is functions the way that it should that all schools should function mm -hmm. as a public school they have proper funding they have you know good facilities they have good teachers they have decent class sizes and so on um, and it's a public school the teachers are unionized as well the only difference between you know the public schools in Menlo Park and Atherton versus East Palo Alto is the property values in those neighborhoods mm -hmm. are drastically different and most places mm -hmm. fund their schools based on local property values mm -hmm. and um, so that's that's really the problem so what does teaching social justice mean well, I think we could break it down to um, two main aspects of that, I think. Um, one is the curriculum, right? What do we teach students to understand um, for everything from, you know, history to science, 
to um, you know literature, and then there's the pedagogy. How are we teaching students, and what kind of skills are students learning, and um, what kind of a person are they learning to be? And, um, and of course, the, both those things overlap. But you know, going back to what we were talking about with democracy, I think the typical curriculum, um, you know, not only the crazy news stories we hear about, you know, the Board of Education in Texas and um, certain textbooks, it's really typical curriculum, at least in social studies, that is, you know, it's become more nuanced over time, but it really is a form of indoctrination to celebrate um, the founding fathers and to think that the United States started out as this democracy with some minor aberrations and flaws, and we just naturally evolved to what we are today rather than thinking that you know, the United States was originally set up as a, a colonial outpost um, with slavery and it had an entire economy based around slavery and um, was completely anti-democratic. And over time, it's been a long struggle from you know, fighting against abolition to fighting for women's suffrage to fighting for workers' rights to fighting for civil rights um, and so on, and it's through that struggle that we have a very limited form of democracy that we have today, and a social democracy, especially um, with the New Deal, that has r really kind of, um, you know, humanized our society, um, despite the you know brutalities of um, unchecked capitalism, and but those have all been struggles. And, um, and I think the typical curriculum just teaches that rather than they, they being struggles, that that's what we started out as. And I really think that's a form of indoctrination. So part of it is to really understand reality and understand history, and that's with curriculum. But the other part, too, is... And I'm going to stop you for a mm -hmm. moment, if I may. There's a lot to unpack here. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you and my director and producer, is is it possible for us to continue this? We'll have a part two for the following month. Um, I don't know if you each would mind. Uh, and Young, are you able to stay and, and do an sure. extra half hour? Mm -hmm. So rather than me lead into my conclusions, because you're offering so much insight here, why don't we just continue our conversation okay. and try to unpack just a few of those things, then sure. I'll let you continue that, that line of thought. Um, you talked about the indoctrination through textbooks. Uh, I, I, history, I, as I remember it, is often told through who was the president, what wars were we fighting, yeah. uh, a very sanitized version. My introduction to real uh, history came when I read Howard Zinn's yeah. People's History of the United States and then delved more into the People's History series. And there's the, the Native Americans' mm -hmm. People's <laughs> History. Uh, and, and, uh, these books are told from the perspective of those who are fighting the struggle, really making the nation what it was. Uh, you mentioned the slaves, for instance. Not only did they support our economy uh, in sugarcane and cotton production, but uh, they built many of our national monuments Absolutely. and buildings and structures. And uh, so you talked about the, the textbooks. The textbooks that are published, tell me a little bit about who publishes them, the process, what yeah. the influence is on um, uh, the publishers. I know California and Texas have a sort of an out, outsized yeah. influence because of their sheer numbers in determining what textbooks are used around the country, but also a little bit about how much leeway ha teachers have in choosing mm -hmm. textbooks, and I'll, I'll let you. Yeah, it varies um, to some degree from state to state and um, school district to school district, but in general, textbook, you know, there are a handful of major mega corporations that publish textbooks, and they're basically, you know, their goal is not to try to indoctrinate anyone. Their goal is to sell to as the biggest market share as possible. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right, California and Texas are a huge part of that market share. And so basically what happens is that, you know, they get all this noise from so many different um, special interest groups or constituencies that are concerned about the way that certain things 
get taught or what gets taught, right? Everything from mm -hmm. evolution to um, teaching about slavery to, you know, you name it, right? Um, this sex education, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I, I read recently that 20 percent of high school biology teachers are creationists, <laughs> biology <laughs> teachers, um, which is just really going to uh, put their students at a disadvantage when they get to college and, and realize yeah. that they, they've missed out on an entire year of biology. Anyhow. So anyway, I mean, you know, regardless of the teacher and regardless of what, you know, the authors of the textbooks want to put in there, you have these different interest groups that basically will, if they're organized enough, and some are, especially um, you know, conservative Christian groups, and they will take it to the um, Board of Education and you know, levy a lot of pressure to get certain things you know, put in there, other things, mostly it's getting, getting them to omit things. But then you have not only that kind of pressure, you have kind of the self-censorship of the textbook publishers, um, the editors and the authors where they feel like if they put anything that would be perceived as being controversial, um, that will limit their potential market share and profits. So therefore... Great. So we're going to continue this discussion. We're going to wrap up this version or this uh, um, uh, segment of Prescription for Justice. My guest has been Hyung Nam uh, talking about teaching social justice and because of his wonderful insights, uh, we are going to continue this in another half hour, which you'll see in our next episode. I want to thank you for joining us. I want to direct you again to the Public Health and Social Justice website, where you can find over 100 open access PowerPoint slideshows that you can feel free to use with appropriate citation for whatever teaching you are doing. Uh, you will also find links to over 1,000 organizations working in the field of social justice, and you will find links to our show on YouTube, Prescription for Justice, or go straight to YouTube and look it up. Thank you very much, Young. We'll continue this in our next episode. Thank you to our viewers. My name is Martin Donahue. This has been Prescription for Justice.